We come now to the subject of work and energy and a new way of solving problems is uh, the goal of this particular chapter. We'll be able to solve problems where the acceleration is not constant after you pick up the tools of this chapter. So wind farms are uh, becoming popular. It's nice and we uh, obtain energy for our society without uh, polluting the air. Um, so what kind of energies? Well, the solar energy is uh, obvious there with the sun. Um, we have, it's not an animated uh, uh, picture here, but with a wind farm, of course, there's going to be wind, the mechanical energy of the motion of the air. Um, there's some chemical energy going on in the plant life that is, uh, is there. So a few forms of energy. Energy is a little bit of an abstract quantity in that it's a bookkeeping tool that allows us to solve problems. Um, certainly objects do possess energy in one form or another, um, but you, you would have a hard time seeing energy, raw energy. It's more exhibited if something is moving, it has kinetic energy. If something has a special position or configuration, it can have potential energy. So let's go ahead and uh, investigate this a little bit with the subject of work. So here we have a person mowing the lawn. Uh, the person pushes down on the handle, perhaps. The lawnmower is going off to the right with this displacement. In calculating work, only the component of the force parallel to the displacement is used to calculate the work. So if we had 40 newtons down the handle, and we have uh, 20 newtons parallel to the displacement. It's only the 20 newtons parallel to the displacement is used to calculate work. So it's something you have to keep in mind. We will be working with vector components here that uh, the force vector must be divided out into components to do the calculation correctly. You must have the component of the force that's parallel to the movement to calculate the work. The component of the force that is perpendicular to the movement does zero work. So that's coming up in the uh, illustrations here. So here we have a case just holding a briefcase, not lifting it up or down. Displacement is zero. Even though there is force acting on the briefcase, the person is supplying force to the briefcase. The person does no work on the briefcase because the displacement is zero. If the person is walking and holding the briefcase level, the person's force is straight up perpendicular to the displacement. The work is zero. This force has no component parallel to the motion. If we go upstairs and uh, you know, our path displacement is up uh, perpendicular, uh, again, it's only uh, force parallel to the displacement that uh, contributes to work. and. We're going to find an easier way than uh, working this than step by step. Um, if someone does work on a briefcase and attaches it to a cable attached to an electric generator, when this uh, briefcase is released and it falls towards the floor, the uh, tension in the cable here will do work on the generator. And since we're attached to the briefcase here, uh, really the uh, energy created by the generator is coming from the loss of energy of the briefcase. It has potential energy that uh, decreases as it goes towards the floor. Um, so those are some of the topics we're going to be discussing in this chapter. Work, kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and potential energy. So here's a, a graph of the force and this is the component of the force that's parallel to the displacement multiplied by the displacement, we get the work. So if you have a diagram of force and displacement, the area under the curve is the work that's been done. Um, if we don't have a rectangular area, see the slanted line here, then it takes a little more work to find the work done. You know, technically, you'd have to use calculus. Now, we're not going to do so in this course, but uh, you can calculate the approximate value of the work by making several thin rectangles and adding up the areas of those rectangles. But on a graph of force versus displacement, 
as long as the force is parallel to the displacement, uh, the area under the curve is the work that's been done. So here is a, a box on a conveyor belt, low friction rollers. There is uh, mg, the gravitational weight downward, the acting on the box. There's normal force upward. The box is traveling off to the right. How much work does the normal force do on the box? The answer is zero. The normal force has no component horizontally. On this, uh, this diagram, we're not going down a plane or on a horizontal conveyor belt. So the normal force does zero work. The mg, the weight, does zero work. But we do have some work done by friction, 5 newtons here. And there's work from some applied force, whether that's uh, a person pushing here or some mechanical device pushing on the box. There will be work done. And the way to calculate that work would be take the size of the force, 120 newtons, multiply by the displacement, 0.8 here. And I think that's about 96 uh, newton meters. And that is the joule unit. When we have newtons times meters, we get joules. So the applied force did 96 joules of work. Friction is also doing work on the box. And the friction force back to the left, displacement off to the right, this is going to be a negative work value. When the force is in the same direction as the displacement, the work is positive. When the force is in the opposite direction to the displacement, the work is negative. And 5 newtons times a displacement of 0.8 meters, that would be minus 4 joules of work. And we could calculate the net work then. We'll do so in example problems. Um, but that net work would be the 96 newtons minus the 4 newtons. So we have 92 newtons of work being done on that box. And in this situation, do you think the box will speed up? There's 120 newtons on the left side pushing and 5 newtons back to the left. Nope. This chapter is uh, not going to deviate from what we learned in previous chapters. There's a net force here, a net force of 115 newtons, and the box will speed up. In fact, there's a relationship between the work done and something called the kinetic energy. We calculate the kinetic energy with 1 half times the mass times the velocity squared the work that is done, the net work that is done, is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. This is called the work energy theorem. Uh, in my class, we'll do some example problems with this. So, a little summary of, and some new material on this slide. Again, work is force times displacement. The force vector must be parallel to the displacement vector. Or you have to take components and find uh, the part of the force that is parallel to the displacement. And again, if the vectors are perpendicular, if the force vector is perpendicular to the displacement vector, the work done is zero. Work gives us change in kinetic energy as long as the potential energy is constant and there's no friction, then the work can all go to change the velocity of the object. And again, kinetic energy, one half mv squared, so we can calculate a final amount of kinetic energy, subtract the initial amount of kinetic energy, that's the change in kinetic energy, that will be equal to the work. So an example of this would be, uh, let's go to ice, moving something on ice where there's very little friction, we'll say it's zero, and the ice is level, it's horizontal, so we're not doing work into lifting the object off of the ice, we're not giving it some gravitational potential energy, so in that situation, the work would be equal to 1 half mv final squared minus 1 half mv initial squared. So driving is a uh, popular activity. And from driver's training, you may have seen a chart where the stopping distance increases dramatically as the speed of the car increases. This is a relationship uh, governed by this uh, formula here, work equals change in kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy goes as the square of the velocity is proportional to the square of the velocity. So in the car, what's doing work to stop the car? It's the brakes. So your brakes have a certain amount of force um, available. Force times the displacement that the rotors of the brake mechanism go past the brake pads. You get force times displacement. You get some negative work done here. 
and the kinetic energy will decrease. The work of the friction is a negative number, um, and we can bring the car to a stop. But the initial amount of kinetic energy, one half mv squared, there's a certain amount of work available, the force of the brakes is constant, the displacement of the car is matches the displacement of the rotors going past the, uh, uh, the brake pads. Um, they're proportional to one another. So we get a situation, if we have a lot of kinetic energy, uh, or a lot of speed, let's say, a lot of speed, uh, we have a lot of kinetic energy initially, and the brakes have to work for a long distance to stop the car. Um, so that's one way to view it. The other way to view it involves the friction with the roadway, uh, pushing back on the car. But uh, in either case, the fact that the kinetic energy depends on the square of the velocity is the reason that the stopping distance for a car is longer than you might think as the speed increases. So oh, gravitational potential energy, if you would lift a book that might be available to you, if you lift it uh, two meters, that would be h, the mass of the book, acceleration due to gravity, and here's h. Does this uh, remind you of a principle that's just been discussed in this video? What is mg? That's the weight of the object. It's a force. And what is h? It would be displacement straight up away from the center of the Earth. So here we have force times distance, potential energy. But we have to do work on an object. We have to apply an upward force to lift the uh, object. We have to apply a force equal to its weight to lift it up at, let's say we go at constant speed upward. Um, so we have to do work of mgh. This is an approximation. It's okay as long as h is very small compared to the radius of the Earth. And if we uh, do examples going out into space, there's a different formula that applies. We'll just do mgh right now. Springs can have a potential energy. We can compress a spring and let it go and it will uh, do work on something, push on something, or we can extend a spring and then attach it to something and it can pull something back, it can do work on something. But we can store energy in a spring. Turns out the energy that's stored is equal to one half times the force constant of the spring. This will be in newtons per meter multiplied by the stretch or compression squared. This will be in meters. So if we would stretch out a spring by 10 centimeters, x would be 0.1. And we come up on a spring that's laying on a table, we stretch it 10 centimeters, x is 0.1. And we'd have to square that, multiply by k, multiply by half, and we would get the number of joules of potential energy in the spring when it is stretched out. So we can do work and change potential energy. If the velocity is constant, then none of our work will go into a change of the kinetic energy. And if our friction is zero, we won't lose any work to uh, uh, non-conservative forces of friction. But if we go horizontal and there's no friction, then the work is the change in the kinetic energy. If we go vertical and move at constant velocity, then work is equal to the change in the potential energy. We're giving an object mgh uh, potential energy. So some examples of this, of the potential energy, a clock that has a weight on it that uh, keeps the drive mechanism in operation. Someone can sort of rewind the system, uh, give the system energy by coming here and doing work on this mass, lifting it up a distance h, the work done, MGH, now supplies the clock with energy that it slowly uh, drains off to uh, operate its mechanism. But that's an example of potential energy, MGH. Carrying a piano up the stairs, there's two ways to do it. You can do the stairs, or perhaps there's uh, some uh, building structure that allows you to attach a cable and lift the piano up this way. Which person does more work on the piano? The person uh, who goes from A to B using the rope attached to the piano, just over a single pulley, uh, or the person who takes the steps. Which one, which person is going to do more work? And the answer is they do the same work. The work is equal to the change in the potential energy. Both, per both individuals cause the piano to go up a height H off of the ground and the piano obtains a potential energy, mgh, 
that comes from the work done by the person. We're ignoring scuffing the feet along the floor here with the friction of uh, the shoe on the floor. We're just doing the calculation. Uh, what's involved with changing the potential energy going upstairs versus straight up on a rope? The H is the same for both situations. The change in the potential energy is the same for both situations. The work is the same for both situations. And this is something about gravitational potential energy and the force of gravity. It does not matter the path that you take. It only matters what is the uh, final point compared to the initial point. Uh, what is H that gives us the uh, gravitational potential energy? Roller coaster rides are popular. Um, back at the start, there's some type of motor that uh, pulls the car to the top of the track. Well, that motor does work on the car and the passengers in the car. It gives them more potential energy. The motor is lifting the system to the high point of the ride. And they go over the ride just about with zero velocity. They're moving just a little bit, but let's ignore that. Let's say they go with zero velocity. What happens to their velocity as they go downhill? It increases, and the fastest speed will be at the lowest point in the ride. Um, so we have one half mv squared building up. The velocity builds up. The mgh of the riders and the car is decreasing as h gets smaller towards the bottom here. So uh, potential energy is going into kinetic energy and then we go up here we get back some potential energy the kinetic energy will decrease. Um, so we'll uh, do some example problems uh, uh, in my class with that but the energy can change forms. We have all potential energy at the start if we would call h equals zero at this valley, then we would have all kinetic energy. And back here we have a mix of potential and kinetic energy. Um, so that's a kind of a future chapter. A uh, little bit on springs. As we've uh, mentioned before, springs have a potential energy if we compress them or extend them. If we do work on the spring, that work delivers energy to the spring. And that potential energy is calculated one half times the force constant times the stretch squared. Um, the force itself is kx and here's a situation where I would ask you can we work problems that involve springs with our four kinematic equations. You know, our first equation was final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration multiplied by time. The answer is no because the acceleration is variable here. The force is variable as the uh, spring would be stretched out and then retracting if it's let go. Uh, the force decreases along here until the force is zero when the spring reaches its equilibrium point. It's at rest uh, stretch amount. So here's an example where energy would let us solve this problem. We can calculate the potential energy. We can calculate kinetic energy along the way. Uh, and know something about the motion of the system. Uh, we could not use our four equations of motion here. The acceleration is not constant. Uh, toys, a uh, little demo. So we have car uh, driven by a spring. One, one path is this purple path. The other is the blue path. And I'm just curious, which do you think will, which path will the car get to the end first? The car will have the same speed on both paths at the final. If we ignore friction, the car will have the same speed. Which path will the car reach the end point first? And it's this bottom path. The velocity is much longer up here, much higher up here, and uh, will reach the uh, right side first. Um, friction, so an eraser rubbing along a surface. Now we come to a non-conservative force. The amount of work done by friction depends on the path. So if we drag the eraser from A to B like this, that's going to be a little bit of work done by friction. If we scribble more with the eraser, a longer path, there's going to be more work done by friction. Uh, gravity and springs, the work does not depend on the motion details. We just need to know the final location and the initial location. 
for friction, we must know the total path involved and that would enable us then to calculate the energy lost to friction. Uh, friction is always doing work along here and the friction vector shifts direction to be, always be opposed to the velocity. Uh, so we always get the full vector force of friction times the uh, path length and we get uh, a situation here where the work does depend on the path for friction. For springs, they're conservative. So if we ignore the friction inside a spring and ignore air resistance, if we have some rock that starts at a certain height, it comes down, it compresses the spring, the gravitational potential energy, mgh, has been converted now here to one-half kx squared to the uh, potential stored, potential energy stored in the spring. And the spring rebounds. If there's no uh, air resistance and no loss of energy in the spring, then this rock will go up to the same height. Right now it has some kinetic energy plus potential. Uh, at the top of the, the motion, the velocity is zero and it has no kinetic energy. Um, so conservative forces, we can get the energy in and out. Uh, for friction, we can't get the energy back. It goes into a thermal energy and is not uh, available to us again in a direct way. Uh, person pushing on a box pushes upward, friction pushes against that. The work that this person puts into the box will not all be recoverable because this friction force is going to take away some energy and make it not available to potential and uh, kinetic energy at the final location of the box. Person sliding into home plate um, has kinetic energy. They don't want to totally fly over home plate. They want to stop, especially if it's a uh, first base or second base or well, second base or third base. Uh, they need to stop at the bag to not be tagged out. Um, so friction can help them stop and ask your coach if this is approved sliding style. Um, I think you'll get uh, some comments on that. But uh, friction, you know, a certain size force, displacement takes uh, occurs here for the person sliding, and friction can take away kinetic energy. Uh, friction produces a negative value for work and takes away kinetic energy. So in summary, work. Calculate it with parallel vectors of force and displacement. If the vectors are perpendicular, the work done is zero. Work can tell us how much the kinetic energy changed. One half mv squared is the formula for kinetic energy. We have a final velocity, we have an initial velocity, uh, but remember to do one half mv squared, square that velocity in calculating kinetic energy. Gravitational potential energy, mgh. Spring potential energy, one half kx squared. k is the force constant for the spring. Uh, the force is equal to minus kx, as we've talked about previously. Um, gravity and, and the force from springs, there is an associated potential energy. Friction does not have an associated potential energy. Gravity and spring forces are conservative. Friction is a non-conservative force. Energy is lost. Work does not have, or sorry, work friction does not have a potential energy associated with it. That's plenty to uh, mull over for today. I'm going to stop. You should read and ask questions.